Hi, my name is Damon Lemby and I'm the CEO of Learn It. I hope you enjoy your class. And if you do, please like and subscribe to my channel because we have plenty of more content coming. Have a good day. Hi there, and welcome to Learn It's course on building productive work habits. My name is Mickey Fitch Collins, and I'll be walking with you through this building productive work habits course today. I have this course structured in a way for you to go through it at your own pace and in your own time, starting and stopping where you need to. I'll be asking you to pause a couple of different times to engage in some reflection and some activities to bolster your own learning. Please make sure that you have a copy of the handout for this class printed or open in another browser window for reference. Today is all about thinking about how you can understand the science of habit formation to create or stop a habit. This workshop is all about not only understanding the science behind habits, but also actively working to start or stop a new habit, real live practice. Again, my name is Mickey Fitch Collins. I'm one of our Learn It Leadership and Professional Development instructors. I'm really excited to be walking through this course with you today. Habits have been such an impactful thing for me professionally and personally, and I'm really excited to bring some of that to you today. I've seen the power of creating these really productive work habits in my own life, and I hope you'll see it too. Let's get started. I'd like to share with you a little bit of folklore, an old story about habits. There once was a wise old man who was called upon to mentor a young boy in a village. The young boy was seen as being stuck in his ways. The wise man took the young boy and said, let's go for a walk in the garden. And they talked about what habits are and what they mean to a person's life. The old man asked the young boy, what does he want to be when he grows up? And the boy described every single detail of what he's going to do when he grows up with so much passion and so much excitement that a half an hour passed feeling like a minute. Then the old man asked the young boy if he had the right habits to achieve what he wanted. The young boy's eyes suddenly turned sad when he realized he didn't have the habits in place and he needed to make some changes. So the wise old man, as they were walking through the garden, suddenly stopped and pointed to a small, tiny plant growing in the cracks and said, pull out that little plant. The young boy puzzled, looked at the old man, and then looked down and grabbed the little plant and pulled it out with no effort. The old man then pointed to a slightly bigger plant and said, pull that one out. And the boy grabbed his fingers around it and pulled it right out. Then the old man pointed to a bush and said, pull that out. And the boy braced himself, pulled it with some effort, but got it out. And they kept walking and the old man said, now pull this one out. And he pointed to a tree. The young boy grasped the trunk, pulled and pulled and pulled with all of his effort, but it wouldn't budge. He said, it's impossible, old man, panting with stress. So it is with bad habits, said the old man, when they are young, and small, it is easy to pull them out, but when they take hold, they cannot be uprooted easily at all. I share that story with you for you to get a chance to think about your own habits. Maybe think about how you function in the workplace. Maybe sometimes you feel a little less sharp. Sometimes you feel like you cut corners. Maybe you have developed some bad workplace habits. We've all been there. Some things that get us stuck in the weeds. Maybe we're doing some micromanaging. We're asking people for last minute meetings. We've had some bad habits that we've put in place. We're giving people ambiguous or unclear direction. As managers, as leaders, as individual contributors, we all have developed habits that serve us well, as well as some that don't serve us well at all. We each need to have the ability to create new habits and replace old habits that aren't serving us anymore. You can learn new skills, but how exactly do you make new habits? Today is all about looking at ourselves, learning and developing these new habits. That is our goal today. Revitalization of ourselves as leaders, managers, and individual contributors with new refreshed habits. So what are we going to explore today? We are going to look at discovering the psychological science behind behavior change. And we're going to explore it through a five-step process to start or stop a habit. And this is all about identification, stages of change, motivation, planning, and action. Now, what this workshop won't do for you is that it's not going to be focused on things like addictive behaviors or troubling behaviors. Obviously, you need to seek 
professional attention for those. But before we get started with that, let's talk about why should we care about creating new and productive work habits. I wanna to offer to you four different frames of thinking about why you should care about building productive work habits. The first one really is about the cost of wasted time at work. Interruption ruins productivity. Research shows that on average people task switch every three minutes and 50% of those interruptions are self-inflicted interruptions. Another reason why you should care is about inefficient meetings. NPR's Marketplace spoke to Nancy Cohen from Harvard Business School about ineffective meetings, and she stated that there are 4 billion meetings a year run in the United States. And over 50% of the people that were surveyed said that half of the meetings they attend are unproductive. That is 2 billion unproductive meetings. Another reason you should care is the cost of a bad boss. According to Online MBA, three out of four working Americans are stressed by their boss, and it is costing U.S. companies $360 billion a year in employee turnover. Or fourth, another reason to care, workplace is the fifth leading cause of death. According to Jeffrey Pfeffer, who is the author of Dying for a Paycheck, How Modern Management Harms Employee Health and Company Performance, he found that there is a clear link between stress and health. And the number one cause for stress for people is the workplace. Looking at the data, Pfeffer and his colleagues, Joel Goh and Stenos Zenios, concluded that a toxic workplace may be responsible for upwards of 120,000 deaths per year. That makes workplace the fifth leading cause of death. This is why making employee health and well-being and self-care is essential for a company's culture and values. And with all of these, there's actions you can take that your company can take to mitigate them. In fact, that's why at companies like Learn It, we are teaching classes around whole health matters self-care, avoiding distractions, time management, running psychologically safe meetings, building trust with your team. But those recommendations alone won't move the needle. They won't make a difference if they don't become habitual. And if those new, better behaviors are replacing old, weak ones, it can be especially difficult. That is what today is all about, helping you make changes in your work and your life that move you from aspirational to actually transformational. In a sense, this is the most important skill you can develop, the skill of habit change. So let's get clear on habits. So let's first get clear about what a habit is. And we need to do so by asking ourselves two questions. What is a habit and what is a behavior? And let's get clear about the difference. A behavior is a single action. Think of phrases like be on your best behavior or the engine in the car isn't behaving right. Habits, on the other hand, are repeated actions or repeated behaviors that become automatic and are difficult to stop. We'll spend today working on habits that are no longer serving you and replacing them with new behaviors that can become habitual. This class is geared towards business, but obviously the same recommendations can work for your personal life as well. And the reason that we're targeting habits is that we want to set up the path for behavior change overall. We're often aware of the behavior we want to improve. Things like, I want to exercise more. I want to be a more hands-off manager. I want to talk less at meetings, or I want to speak up more at meetings. Developing good habits is how you build better behaviors. Now that we know what habits are, let's identify some bad habits that we see in the workplace. We all know some common health habits that we want to start. Things like, I want to floss my teeth or stop nail, you know, biting my nails, exercise more regularly, go to bed earlier. But what about work habits? What I want you to do is I want you to think about habits that you see in the workplace. It could be habits that you see in a manager. It could be habits that you see in an individual contributor. It could be habits you do or habits you see other people do. Think about meetings you attend, communication you send, your calendar. What habits are there? There can be good habits that you'd like to see, bad habits that you'd like to see gone. And what I want you to do in a minute here is pause the video and write down as many workplace habits as you can in just a couple of minutes. And don't worry, I'm gonna share lots of real life examples to help you. 
taken from crowdsourcing from our team here at Learn It. So go ahead and hit pause, generate that list, and when you're ready, hit play again. So here are a few examples you may have come up with. Things like not trusting your staff, getting in the weeds, treating your priority as everyone's priority, maybe calling last minute or impromptu meetings, micromanaging your team, not setting clear goals, duties, deliverables for your staff, having a lack of empathy or trust in your team, right? Maybe other things like leading meetings that always go over time, being the hero manager and jumping in and just doing the work for your staff. Maybe doing things like not taking an active role in your direct reports growth, frequently canceling one-on-ones, penalizing star employees by giving up too much work, right? Sometimes there's other things like workplace general habits that we have too, of like interrupting people, sticking with bad routines, not feeling like you're saying everything that you're thinking or contributing as much as you could. Again, leading meetings that always go over time. Maybe there's other habits like having poor listening habits, saying yes to everything without checking your calendar, without checking your priority list, talking too much during meetings, not composing or, or experiencing or being true to your emotions in the workplace, or perhaps going too far, right? Holding people to unstated expectations. There's even things like, you know, thinking about our health and wellness workplace habits, skipping lunch breaks, not getting up and stretching from your desk, checking social media with every moment of downtime that you have, scheduling or not scheduling time for emails so that you feel super overwhelmed, right? Maybe not drinking enough fluids or having enough snacks during the day. So these are a lot of different examples. Perhaps you came up with some similar ones on the list that you created, but these are ones that just our Learn It team came up with that help us get a better idea of what are some of the habits that maybe we encounter. I love this quote about habits. It's oftentimes actually attributed to Aristotle, but it was actually Will Durant that said this. We are what we repeatedly do. Excellence then is not an act, but a habit. So we've looked at a lot of different examples of habits to get our brains kind of primed for some of the activities coming up. Now let's jump into this five-step process for habit change. I wanna introduce you to the process of habit change that we're going to work through for the rest of the workshop. First, what we're going to do is we're going to identify the habit that you either wanna start or stop. Next, we're going to look at what stage of change you are in for this particular habit. The third step is investigating your motivation for change. The most important part of the step is the plan, where you are actually going to work through PBO, Prompt Behavior Outcomes. This is going to help you really ratify this into a habit. And then we're going to look at actually taking action, the small steps that you can begin immediately. So let's go ahead and dive into Identify. Our first step in the process is to identify and explore the habit that we wanna start or stop. So what we're actually going to do is utilize that handout that I referenced earlier. So if you look at the top of page one on that handout, what I want you to do is I want you to write down each change that you wanna make. It can be personal or professional. Obviously we're talking about the professional environment here, so perhaps pick a couple of workplace ones. But it needs to be something that you're comfortable talking with other people about because I want you to share this with others. What workplace habits do you have that you want to let go of? And so what I want you to do in a minute here is pause that video and I want you to list those habits on your handout. So go ahead and pause that video. Take about two to three minutes. Try it yourself. Reflect on these questions. And when you're ready, go ahead and hit that play button again. Hopefully from that little think and write activity, you have a list of habits that you want to start or stop. Now remember, these habits are things that are automatic. They're not once-off behaviors. So what I want you to do now is out of all of those habits that you listed from the prior activity, I want you to select the two central habits that are most important to you. And we're going to be using these two habits for the remainder of the workshop. We're going to call these 
two turns. The two habits that we will turn into healthy workplace habits. So I want you to go ahead and go to the bottom of page one, write down these two habits on that handout. And if you're trying to stop a habit, you're going to be turning it around into a habit that you want to start. For example, if you want to stop being the hero manager, jumping in to do the work for your team, you want to turn this into, I'm going to allow my direct reports to speak and act first before jumping in. Or maybe if you want to stop sk skipping lunch breaks, you want to change that behavior and turn it into, I want to start having lunch breaks. So go ahead and write down those two turns on the bottom of page one. Now that we've identified the two habits that we want to turn into more positive workplace habits, it's time for us to explore the causes of each one of those habits. It's oftentimes that we are spending time replacing a bad habit with good habits, so we really need to dig down and understand what's underneath all of that. So what I want you to do in a minute here, I'm going to ask you to hit pause and generate a list of answers to the questions that you see on your handout on page two. On the handout, you see those questions of when did the habit start? When do you want to start the new habit? How has the bad habit changed over time? And I love these next two questions. What does the bad habit do for you? And the last one is what does the what actions, feelings or people are linked to the habit? So go ahead and hit pause, take three to five minutes or so to go ahead and answer those questions on page two. And when you're ready, go ahead and hit play again. All right, welcome back. The reason we investigate the habit is to gain a deeper understanding into what caused the habit to start in the first place. In order to change the habit, to turn it into a good habit, we need to know why it occurred, what actions, feelings, and people are linked to that habit, so when we go to plan the steps to build a new habit, we can target exactly the right behavior to be able to stick with a new, more positive habit. For example, let's say you want to eat healthier. Okay, personal example here. You want to eat healthier, but your spouse keeps candy in the cupboard. It's going to be make it really challenging for you to build a new positive habit. So you're going to need to take this into account when you are moving from that bad habit to the positive habit. Like maybe your spouse can hide that candy somewhere else in the house so that you don't know where it is. The second step of the process is to investigate the stage of change that you're in. What gets in the way of changing your habits? Do these sort of things sound familiar to you? Things like, I'm too busy at the moment. I'll start it another time. I'll bookmark that for later, and later never comes. Or maybe you say things like, I didn't have time for a big new project, and this change just seems too big for me right now. Or maybe you have some self-doubt. Maybe you've said, I don't really know if I can do this. And so because of that, and because I'm not really disciplined, I'm not going to try. Or maybe you're looking for inspiration. You're waiting for the right magical moment to come, but you don't actually have the energy to implement it. We can use a behavior change method called the trans theoretical model of behavior change to help us investigate how likely we are to make steps to change into our chosen habit. So let's check that out next. The trans theoretical model was developed in the late 1970s, and it operates on the assumption that people don't change behaviors quickly and decisively. Rather, our change in behavior, especially habitual behavior, occurs in a continuous, small, micro sort of fashion. And it actually occurs in a cyclical format or a cyclical process. And what we can do is we can apply this five phase model to habit formation. These stages, by the way, are listed on page three of your handout. The first one is pre-contemplation. In this stage, people don't intend to take action within the foreseeable future, within like the next six months. People are oftentimes unaware that their behavior is problematic or that it produces negative consequences or outcomes. And people in this stage often kind of underestimate the pros of changing their behavior and place too much emphasis on the cons of changing their behavior. The next stage in the process is contemplation. In this stage, people are intending on starting the healthy behavior in the foreseeable future, 
likely in the next six months. People can recognize that their behavior may be problematic and they've had kind of a more thoughtful and, and practical consideration of the pros and the cons that the behavior does and doesn't do for them with equal emphasis placed on both. Even with that recognition though, people still may feel rather hesitant or ambivalent towards changing their behavior. Preparation, or sometimes called determination, is the next stage. In this particular stage, people are ready to take action within the next 30 days. People start taking small steps towards that behavior change, and they do actually believe that this behavior change is going to lead to a healthier life. The next stage is action. In this stage, this is when people have recently changed their behavior and are continuously changing their behavior, now within the last six months. And they intend to continue to move forward with the new healthy habit, with the new behavior change. People in this stage may exhibit, you know, showing off their modified new behaviors and acquisition of these new healthy behaviors. You can see this in those people. In this stage, you might actually start tweaking that habit process, making some of those micro changes as you've experienced the development of this new habit. The last stage is maintenance. In maintenance, people have sustained their behavior of change for a while, six plus months, and they intend to maintain that behavior moving into the future. People in this stage work to prevent relapse to earlier stages. You have to be in this stage in order for things to actually be considered a habit. Now, one of the things that you don't see on this model is the idea of relapse. And relapse happens to a lot of people. Relapse is when we drop back, maybe we exit or we re-enter the stages of change at any time. Think about how many of you have ever tried to try out a new healthy habit one week in and you've already dropped it. Maybe it's a New Year's resolution, you're super excited, ready to go January 1st, and then by February 1st, you've dropped off, right? This is a normal process of behavior change. This occurs for a lot of different reasons, but the biggest reason is because you probably haven't put the correct plan into place to make it an easy habit. More on that coming up soon. Why is it important for you to understand these stages of change? By understanding this cycle, you gain a deeper level of insight or a deeper level of understanding about your own internal motivation and desire to change. If you know what stage you're in when you're investigating your habit, you can likely predict your success at making that behavior change and turning that behavior change into a habit. It can help you answer the question of why you get stuck when you're creating a new habit, or alternatively, why a behavior change didn't actually turn up into a habit. Up next, we're going to be looking at how to apply this particular model. I'm going to give you a couple of real life case studies in order for us to really make sure that we understand this trans theoretical model and these different stages of change. So let's work through a couple of case studies together. The first one is Alaya. Alaya is aware of the positives and consequences of asking for last minute meetings of her staff. She recognizes that while it helps her address client needs relatively quickly, it really puts her staff out because it's disrupting their workflow and their schedules. She's made a small commitment to changing this habit by reviewing her calendar and tallying up the last minute meeting requests she's made. So my question to you is what stage of change do you think she's in? If you wanna go ahead and pause the video and think on that, go ahead and do that. And when you're ready, hit play again. Okay, maybe you've had a little bit of time to think about that. The answer is she's in the preparation or determination stage. In this stage, right, people are ready to take action within the next 30 days, and they start taking small incremental steps towards the behavior change, knowing that that is going to allow them to think that they can actually make the bigger behavior change. Let's take a look at another one. Jalen wants to make a change on how much he talks during meetings. He knows that his voice dominates the discussions, but who else is gonna speak up? He feels ambivalent to the change and isn't sure that he can do it. Keep quiet in the meetings? I'm not sure. So what stage of change is Jalen in? Again, pause the video, think about this for a minute, and when you're ready, hit play. Okay, so maybe you have your answer. And the answer is contemplation. In this stage, people are intending to start a new behavior in the foreseeable future, defined as kind of the next six months, and they recognize that their behavior may be problematic and they're thinking a little bit about the pros and cons. 
even with that recognition of the pros and cons, people may still feel rather ambivalent towards making the change overall. What I'd like you to do is review the stages of change on the screen on the right hand side there and take a moment to think about what stage of change are you in for those two habits that you are going to turn, right? Remember our two turns from that. And pause if you need to come up with your answer and then hit play again. So far we've identified our two turn habits that we want to change today and turn them into the habits that we want to start. We've investigated our actions and our thoughts around these two habits and we've identified what stage of change we are in using that trans theoretical model. The next thing we're going to be looking at is our motivation and motivational interviewing. Motivational interviewing can help drive a more sustainable behavior change to make a new behavior a habit. Motivational interviewing makes the conversation much more powerful. Ideally, this is with a coach, but it's also a conversation that you can have with yourself or even with a partner to help facilitate some of this small behavior change. It helps you to uncover and reorient how you think and feel about the changes that you want to make. So it's important for us to consider some motivation questions. The most important part about asking these questions is to not give advice, judgment, or your opinion. Think of it as a time to practice your listening skills. Remember, when people talk themselves into changing, they are much more likely to turn intention into action. Open-ended questions are the secret to this part. They often start with how, why, what, or what if. So on the screen, you see a variety of different questions that you can ask yourself. You can have a partner ask you based on the different stage of change that you're in. If you want to, go ahead and pause the recording at this point so that you can take a look at these questions even further to see how they fit with the stage of change that you're in. Let's check into where we're at so far. We've identified that habit we want to start or stop. We, we've investigated that stage of change that we're in. We've reflected on our motivations to change using that list of questions that we had on the last slide. Now it's time to move to the plan and to action. This is the fun part, right? This is when we start to get creative about the steps that you're going to use to make your change happen. Remember, a habit is a behavior that is performed regularly or even automatically. Changes that might seem small and unimportant at first will compound into remarkable results if you're willing to stick to them. Think of it like compound interest at a bank. It seems to make little to no impact every day, but day after day, month after month, year after year, this can be enormous. This part is about process, not the goal. The goal can actually cause conflict. Either you achieve a goal and you're successful or you fail and you're a disappointment. Has anybody ever had that goal of, I'm going to lose five pounds. And then, you know, when you don't lose those five pounds, you consider yourself to be a huge disappointment, right? You set the goal maybe by day four and you already have self-sabotaged that goal and you feel like a failure. So we don't want to do that, right? Most behavioral scientists can agree that there is some pattern or combination of three main components to habit formation, okay? This is prompt, either a trigger or cue, behavior, which is repetition, and the outcome, the reward or the result. The prompt can be any prior action, right? So this could be a time of day, this could be a location, anything that triggers that habitual behavior. This could be the way that your mind associates things with that habit, and it allows you to build that process of it becoming automatic. The behavior is the actual habit itself, and the outcome, such as a reward, creates that positive feeling, which reinforces the habit loop. It makes us want to do that over and over. So let's get into this PBO process plan. All right, it's time for us to talk about the PBO process plan. Here are the three steps. This is actually the trickiest part of habit formation. The first one is the prompt, and you wanna do what you can to keep it super simple and easy. This could be a reminder on your phone, a string on your finger, whatever it looks like. Don't underestimate the power of a trigger. When you're trying to start a new habit, make the pathway to the behavior as easy as possible. Maybe you're trying to commit yourself to starting and ending meetings on time. Then you need to set an alarm with a five minute remaining or a 10 minute remaining alarm. 
Maybe you're starting to try to have a habit where you're communicating updates more regularly to the company. Place a 10 minute weekly reoccurring booking in your calendar so that you can go ahead and set that time aside. The second piece of the PBO plan is behavior, B for behavior. It is important when starting a habit to start small with the behaviors, start as small as possible. It needs to be the tiniest first step to get you going. Nothing big, nothing ambiguous, small, tiny, minute, baby steps, but things that are really, really specific. If you are starting a new habit, you need to make it as easy as possible for you to do it. If you're changing a habit, small, tiny steps, okay? And then the third part is outcome. The outcome is the reward and it's the end goal of every single habit. It needs to actually be instantaneous so that your brain links the behavior to the reward. It's the thing that actually positively reinforces the behavior. If you think about an example from the consumer world, right? There was a marketing team that found that consumers were desiring a fresh scent at the end of a cleaning ritual, right? So this marketing team was investigating what is it about cleaning products that people really like? And what they liked was that they liked that fresh scent that happened at the end of a cleaning ritual or a process. What they did was they actually created a process that skipped right to the good part. You know what that process or what that product is? Febreze. So what they found was that it actually linked the reward with the outcome. It's called contingency management, and it's the formal term for using rewards to change behavior. This is used a lot in psychiatric settings or therapy sort of settings. The contingency is essentially the rule that you must complete X in order to get Y reward. No exceptions. If you're starting or stopping a new habit, you need to make it satisfying. You just need to make sure that your rewards immediately happen after doing the routine. So again, so your brain knows to connect the two. Dopamine is the neurotransmitter that happens in our brain, right? This is the chemical messenger that is heavily involved in learning and motivation. To put it really, really simply, your brain loves dopamine and it will rapidly learn what actions produce dopamine. So in the process, your brain and your body are quickly working together to reinforce the action dopamine cycle so that you're building habits that reinforce that dopamine production. There are three rules of rewards that I want to offer to you when thinking about this. Only focus on one thing at a time is the first rule. The second one is don't reward yourself with something that perpetuates the behavior you're trying to stop. I see this most often when people are trying to lose weight and they reward themselves with a meal when they've lost five pounds. The third rule is be careful about abstinence rewards. When you focus too much on abstinence, it's easy to get into a loop of not being able to achieve your habit because you were too strict, right? So therefore you're, you're never rewarding yourself and so you're never making progress because you're not linking behavior with a reward. So let's check this out a little bit further. Say one of the examples is ending meetings on time that we've talked about before. You put in a reminder, a trigger, a 10 minute alarm right before, you know, 10 minutes prior to the end of the meeting to announce that there's 10 meetings left. The outcome then, or the reward that you get is that maybe you take a coffee break outside, get a little bit of sun, sunshine, a little bit of fresh air, right? And reward yourself for having a few extra meetings because you, or a few extra minutes because you didn't run that meeting over time. So that is an example of how the PBO process works. Let's check out what this is gonna look like for you. All right, it's time for you to work on your own PBO plan. It's time to plan the change. If you take a look at page five of your handout, what I want you to do is I want you to work through that for both of the habits that you've identified that you want to start or stop. So take some time to think about those two turn habits. Plan the prompt, the behavior, and the outcome. And remember, here's the time where you consider your stage of change. You must tailor your plan to where you're at. If you're in pre-contemplation, you're not ready to make the change yet. Even when you're trying to establish a habit formation plan, it's most likely that you're going to have trouble changing that behavior because you're in that pre-contemplation stage. So you're gonna wanna go back to the beginning and think about a different habit, right? Because we actually want to work on creating some change. If you're in contemplation, this is where you're weighing pros and cons and you're thinking about that habit. Preparation, 
This is where we're starting to take those small little baby steps. Get that process in place now and make preparation steps to help begin changing your behaviors to move that to a habit. If you're in the action stage, great, right? You might even want to start tweaking your habit or tweaking some of those behaviors to further develop what that process looks like. And maybe you're in the maintenance stage. People in this stage, what you should be focusing on really is about maintenance and making sure that you know you are focused on that maintenance and focusing on not moving back into relapse. So go ahead, pause the video. This should take you anywhere from 8, 10, 12 minutes to work through those two turn habits that we established towards the beginning of the workshop. And I want you to take some time to really think deeply, really work on that plan hit the pause button. When you're ready to come back, hit that play button and we'll continue. Great news. We are now at the final step and the most important step, taking action. Keep in mind, this isn't about willpower. This is about time and consistency. How will you follow through with your PBO plan? This is what we're going to talk about next. Don't worry, I have a bunch of strategies to help you take action and stay in action. So we've come a long way in thinking about this process. We've looked at identifying the habits we want to build, how to stay motivated and understand our motivation throughout the different stages of change, and how to build a plan for success. We are poised for some good things to happen. But I wouldn't be surprised if you've been this close before to making big changes like exercising more or something like that, only to see those running shoes collecting dust in a corner. What I'm about to share with you are nine different tips for following through on your plan so that you can turn them into actions and when repeated long enough will become lasting habits. So a few strategies for habit making. Here's some tricks that to help you kind of tailor your plan to you. What we realize is we may need many strategies because what works for some people doesn't actually work for all people or what worked for you at one point in your life may not work for your life right now. And let's face it, creating a new habit doesn't always feel great. So all of this work and the steps and everything you've done doesn't mean that it's going to be easy. Sometimes it even sucks building a new habit. You don't feel like it. It's too hard, whatever that looks like. But keep in mind that some is better than none. Give yourself a break and keep going. This is the part of the PBO that is so important, is to keep that, ha that habit change as small as possible to start, to make it easier on yourself. Want to start exercising? Start with five minutes. That sum makes you, means you're more likely to do it in the future. So the first action step I want to offer to you that you see on the screen is to change the prompt or the trigger if it's not working. And if it's not working, try something different. Let's say every day you wanted to floss your teeth and your prompt was piling a bowl of new floss on the counter, but it didn't work. You're still not flossing. What about a new prompt that you can try instead? What about maybe putting a sticky note on the bathroom mirror? Maybe that would help you. So changing the prompt or changing the trigger. The second strategy is called habit linking, linking an action you need with an action you want. So maybe you want to drink more water during the day, link the water bottle sipping every time you get an email from one of your colleagues. And obviously you want it to be somebody that you hear from pretty often during the day. A third strategy is considering your environment. The friction of an environment can be decreased so that it makes it easier for you to explore and enjoy a new habit. It's easier for us to start new habits in new environments rather than old ones. But not all of us have the luxury of changing our environment all the time. So maybe what we need to do is actually change some of the things in our physical environments. So maybe the habit that you want to do is decrease your cell phone usage, stop the constant check-ins, stop the constant social media check-ins. Maybe if you normally keep your phone on your desk, maybe you need to put it in a bag on the floor or keep it in another place in the house. Change the environment. Another strategy to think about making those habits stick is a language shift. Try to change the way that you speak to yourself. Say things like, I get to, instead of I have to. For example, maybe one of the examples was, you know, somebody wanting to speak up less in meetings, right? And so instead of saying, I have to be more quiet in meetings, you can say something like, I get to listen to my colleagues more. Another strategy is to verbalize. 
So saying it out loud as you're doing it, making it real. One of the examples we used before, an example to make it real and verbalize it is, I am not calling an impromptu meeting. Look at me, I am scheduling the meeting for the next available time that my team can come together. I'm not pulling together people at the last minute. Another strategy is focusing on making habits rather than breaking habits. That's what we've done today. It's much easier for us to create new habits than break old ones. Think about that folklore story that I told in the beginning. It's so difficult, if not impossible, for us to pull up that tree that has taken root. But can we plant a new tree? Can we put a little bit of a seedling in there? And with consistency and time, it can grow and it can overtake that old tree. More strategies for you here, accountability. Keep yourself accountable. I highly encourage that you share your plan with other people. Send a message to someone who supports you. This could be a colleague, a friend, a mentor, a boss, someone that cares about you. Share with them that you are trying a new habit and what the habit is and what your plan is. And let them know what that process is so that they can help hold you accountable. Another way to do this is to actually track your progress. Think about, is it a calendar that maybe you need to make things visible, an app for tracking, a chart to check off every time you successfully do the new behavior? What is your tracking solution? Maybe you can check out on the handout, we have a link there with a bunch of different solutions, some different tracking apps that you could check out on the handout there. The last strategy I wanted to offer to you is one about relapse. If you remember in that trans theoretical model, we talked about relapse and that it can happen anytime. You can drop backwards, you can step out, you can re-enter, okay? We need to recognize that making a new habit is tough and sometimes, you know, we step back in place. A third of the time our new habit is going to be enjoyable, a third of the time we're going to feel neutral about it, and a third of the time it's probably going to feel painful or uncomfortable. But we have to be able to get through that. So make yourself a relapse plan. So now is the time for us to take action. How will you follow through with your habit? What strategies will you use that we've discussed? What I want you to do is I want you to take three to five minutes and on page six of your handout, actually think about your plan of action. Spend time now to create that plan of action. Use the handout to answer the questions and prepare for yourself to take action. Ask yourself, can you take any of these actions now? Can you put a reminder on your phone, sign up for a tracking app, contact a support person for accountability? So I want you to pause the video right now, go ahead and fill that out on your handout. And when you're ready, hit play. If you're a manager, I have some specific actions for you to take. I want you to think about this for yourself, but I also want you to think about this as a leader, right? I also want you to think about your lanes as a manager from beginning to end your lanes as a colleague from be beginning to end, right? There are some things that are within your capacity and within your control to help facilitate change. So for those of you that are managers, what I want you to do is I want you to pause the video for a minute here and respond to the questions that you see on the screen. What are questions that you could ask your team specifically around habits of where they are in contemplating habit change? So pause the video for a moment, Try this out, write some thoughts, and when you're ready, hit play. I want to leave you with a quote from James Clear, who's the author of Atomic Habits. What he said was, build identity-based habits, which is focusing on the type of person you wish to become rather than the outcome you wish to achieve. How you identify yourself, your beliefs, what you tell yourself matters. Things like, I am a non-smoker rather than I'm trying to stop smoking. I am a coaching manager rather than I am trying to stop being an overbearing manager. I am a respected colleague rather than I am trying to stop going over time in meetings. I am the person who moves and is active every day rather than I'm trying to lose five pounds. You can't rely on motivation to keep you going. You have to become the type of person you want to be, and that starts with you choosing your new identity for yourself. What I will ask you is this, who do you wish to become? 
This concludes our time together in this workshop. I hope that you've learned some real tactical and practical workplace habits, tips, and actions that you can apply to your work today. From all of us at Learn It, I want to thank you for engaging with this training. We hope you enjoyed it, and we'll check out another one of our workshops in the future. Have a great day.